Good afternoon everyone. This is Dr. Rostenberg and today's video is going to pick up where the previous video left off. Today we're talking about methylation, MTHFR, and gut problems and we're focusing our attention on SIBO which is a an increasingly common disorder uh, that I hope to share with you um, as to how that comes about. So SIBO is increasing in the population we have research that shows why and how and that's the essence of today's video if you want to learn more about what SIBO is and how it impacts the methylation cycle I would direct your attention to the previous video as it does a much better job explaining that so today's video you know I'm gonna show this slide from last time the, the reason SIBO is important for everyone listening and for individuals like myself and others who are working with methylation issues and looking at balancing biochemistry if you have a gut problem you have a biochemistry problem and the reason why is shown right here in this slide table 3 taken from this study published in 2007 manifestations of SIBO inability to gain weight fatty stools vitamins and mineral deficiencies Important vitamins here, guys A, D, E, and K. We're looking at clotting disorders, immunodeficiency, uh, thyroid, you know, infertility. All kinds of things can be caused by vitamin deficiencies like these B12, iron, anemia, and excess folate. So, too many bugs pooping out folic acid will mess up the methylation cycle. Now, for more information on this, I would again direct your attention back to the previous video. But this is right. This is why SIBO is important to know what it is, and today we're going to talk about what causes it. Again, as a quick refresher, the methylation genes, in my opinion, that are most sensitive to gut problems are listed here. Um, this is not a a full list of all the genes that can have an impact, but it's a it's a good sampling of them. Um, gut infections and gut imbalances create sympathetic stress in your body. When your body experiences sympathetic activation or sympathetic stress, it means that the adrenal glands are going to turn on and blood's going to move out of your gut into your muscles and your digestion is going to get even more impaired. So it's kind of a downhill uh, snowball effect where the gut infection causes stress in the body, stress in the body impairs digestion in the immune system, the gut infection gets worse, and the symptoms get worse over and over again. So this is what we see in our office. And these are the genes most responsible. Um, you know, going through each gene today is outside the scope of this video, but if you look on my site, beyondnthfr.com, there will be uh, information there to, to help you understand. Um, you know, getting weird symptoms when you take vitamins is a dead, dead giveaway that there's something going on in the gut. And, and that's, that's why SIBO is so important to investigate. The IgA genes here are also real important because they predispose us to having a leaky gut. So if you're the type of person who has methylation genes like MTHFR, CONT, MAOA, GAD, and others, and you also have leaky gut genes, well, what goes on in your gut is definitely going to affect not just your gut, but your brain and how you feel, your attitude, your, your spiritual uh, you know, health, your, your mental health. Everything will be affected by what's going on in your gut. So getting your gut figured out is really that important. Now, when I was looking at the research to figure out what caused SIBO, I was a little surprised that the medications that are often used to treat gut problems or gut complaints are actually the main reasons why SIBO happens in the first place. And a, a medica a class of medication that I really don't like, I mean from a chiropractic point of view and a structural point of view, uh, these drugs are very dangerous and I'll go into that in another video, but proton pump inhibitors cause a lot of harm in our society and it, it has to do with the fact that when you shut off digestion and you make stomach acid go away, which is what these do, proton pump inhibitors, PPI drugs, cause bacterial overgrowth in your gut. So yes, PPI drugs, acid blocking drugs predispose you to having SIBO. It causes SIBO in some cases. Um, you know, um, IBO, intestinal bowel overgrowth, occurs significantly more 
among long-term users of PPI than control subjects. Okay, so basically what this is saying is 2010 study says that if you take acid blocking drugs, you have a significant increase in small bowel overgrowth. Well, that's what we're talking about. So proton pump inhibitors are a number one suspect for causing this epidemic in our population and therefore causing methylation issues. So yes, your stomach acid blocking drugs can cause methylation problems because it causes SIBO. So if you're looking for an alternative, that's what uh, practitioners like myself and others can do for you. Um, GERD is a common issue. Again, PPI drugs are the go-to treatment for that. It's the standard of care. Um, however, they noticed that initially, after the first eight weeks, that you know, uh, they saw bloating and gas and pain and diarrhea after being on these drugs for eight weeks. And after six months, the incidence of bowel symptoms got worse. So prolonged PPI treatment produces bowel symptoms and small intestinal bowel overgrowth. It's right there in the literature. The, one of the main causes, one of the three main causes of SIBO are drugs designed to treat acid reflux. These are drugs that are really good at covering up the symptom, but they're really, really, really bad at actually treating the problem. They're the top selling drugs in the country. I think that Nexium is uh, sells, you know, they've sold they've sold billions and billions of dollars worth of the little purple pill. And the reason you know what I'm talking about, the little purple pill, is because of the effectiveness of their advertising. So when you shut off stomach acid, you also re pr inhibit release of bile, and bile is so important for absorbing vitamins. Uh, it, it helps you remove cholesterol, so it protects you from you know the side effects of having too much cholesterol. It allows you to absorb vitamins, especially calcium. So everybody out there with osteopenia and osteoporosis need to get your bile system working better. Now a lot of my patients have had their gallbladder removed, and even though your gallbladder is gone, you can still improve that system and make sure you're nourishing your digestive tract. But I would suggest to you that if your bile, if your uh, gallbladder has been removed, you need to be extra diligent about making sure that part of your system is still working because even though the gallbladder is gone the job it has to do never goes away we were not born with any spare parts just ask any parent they'll tell you these are pictures of micelles which is the scientific term for tiny fat fat globules fat uh, globules that uh, you know these are microscopic little balls of fat that have a little bit of something inside them that float in water and basically this is what soap does soap breaks up big globs of fat and causes it to form little tiny droplets well your bile does the same thing so when you eat fish oil and healthy salmon and grass-fed beef and you take your vitamin D and your vitamin E your bile helps you absorb that because it breaks those globs down into tiny pieces so that you can easily absorb them so without bile you don't get that benefit but in terms of SIBO, you got to remember: why do we wash our hands before we go? Why do we why do we wash our hands before we eat dinner? Why do we wash our hands after we've been, you know, uh, working in the garden all, all day? And the reason we do that is because soap removes bacteria. It causes the bacteria to flush off of our skin and gets it out of the way, so when we go eat, we don't get sick. Well, guess what? Bile does the exact same thing for you in your own gut. So it says it right here, potent antimicrobial agents that prevent bacterial overgrowth in the small bowel. Well, isn't that nice? Bile prevents SIBO. So we can say that the rise in SIBO is a side effect of the loss of healthy gallbladder function in our society as a whole. That makes logical sense. Now just realize that bile is important when you shut off your stomach acid it doesn't release very much one of the main causes for getting gallstones in the first place is not having enough stomach acid I'll go, in, I'll go into that in another video but suffice it to say that bile protects you from SIBO if you don't have enough bile you will have too much bacteria in your gut it will interfere with your nutrition it will mess up your methylation cycle and it can cause osteoporosis because bile helps you absorb calcium. So we want to make sure our, our gut or our stomach is getting acidic and our bile is being released. These are two important parts. This caught my attention because 
a lot of people are doing breath tests for H. pylori and you can actually get false positive tests okay so if anybody out there has done a breath test for H. pylori you can actually get false positives it has nothing to do with the stomach you're actually seeing the uh, test show positive based on what's in the small intestine not just the stomach so when people have this SIBO problem you know the traditional diagnostic techniques can confuse the issue so you know I would always get a second opinion if you think you have H. pylori uh, because you may not and antibiotics as you'll see may not be your best bet because they can cause SIBO okay that's right antibiotics may cause SIBO and what happens is um, when you kill something with an antibiotic or you take an antibiotic it kills all of your bacteria it doesn't really discriminate between the good guys and the bad guys it's like lighting you know the side of the mountain on fire all the all the trees are gonna burn that that are gonna burn okay and once that fire is put out once the antibiotic has done its thing there's a lot less competition for nutrition and for space and so the aggressive bacteria that survive the antibiotics what we would call the antibiotic resistant bacteria that is increasing in our healthcare system we hear about that more and more those antibiotic resistant bacteria are going to take advantage of the situation like any any living thing would and it's going to grow quickly so yeah you know basically salmonella can proliferate and create inflammation it can grow and create inflammation if the normal bacteria becomes disrupted by treatment with antibiotics okay so if you take antibiotics and you destroy your good probiotics it is more likely that you will have SIBO and I will continue to explain why C. diff infections are a big problem they are they cause diarrhea and they can you know too much diarrhea can put you in the emergency room because if you lose electrolytes you can lose your life so this is not a laughing matter but C. diff is a bigger problem because somebody who and someone who takes antibiotics it creates a situation where C. diff becomes more aggressive um, basically with disruption of indigenous bacteria after treatment with antibiotics broad spectrum antibiotics C. diff can significantly increase in abundance followed by severe intestinal inflammation this is the this is the latest peer-reviewed literature telling us that antibiotics cause SIBO one more study here uh, you know E. coli is a normal part of our gut it belongs there it's supposed to be there and it should be there in everybody's gut but when you kill the good bacteria with antibiotics, the aggressive types of E. coli go nuts and they live off all that extra space and all that extra nutrition and they create, they create inflammation. I have, I've had patients who have lived through an E. coli infection, infection. It went from their gut into the, into the bladder, into the prostate, and into the bloodstream. It's, it, this is serious stuff. When you disrupt your gut bacteria, you become, you weaken your body and you open yourself up for, uh, Health emergencies that in other in all you know other ways can be prevented and reversed uh, naturally. This is just an artist rendition of you know here's the healthy bacteria eating nutrition that's shared by the bugs. The bad bugs and the good bugs share nutrients. Okay, so if you kill these bad bugs or excuse me, you kill the good bug good bugs, then the bad bugs have more access to this nutrition, and then they will go into the lining of the mucosa. And create this red leaky gut issue with your cells lining your gut so pathogenic E. coli is capable of using carbohydrates high sugar foods soda you know stuff that you know fast food this is the foods that feed these bugs uh, which is different from that which uh, our natural bugs eat so our healthy bacteria does not eat fast food chips uh, birthday cakes and cupcakes right those foods feed the really aggressive types of bacteria so we want to make sure that um, we don't have any of that aggressive bacteria in our gut and we don't want to eat that kind of food to promote it so we got to be really careful of who and what lives in our gut because our health and our lives really do depend on that um, some more research was showing again uh, that atrophic gastritis this is kind of uh, another knock against the PPI drugs, which uh, I'm not too fond of. Um, 
bacterial overgrowth is caused by the use of PPI drugs and it causes production of folate, folic acid, which can disrupt your methylation cycle. And I just want everybody out there to understand that a lot of methylation issues, especially the really strange ones that are hard to figure out, are based on uh, patients with a bacterial problem that's not being addressed. So they keep taking vitamins, and keep eating supplements, and keep eating foods, and all they do is get worse. Well, it's not the food, it's not the vitamins, it's the gut. Understanding that is really important. Here's the science that shows that. One other thing we look at in my office during uh, in-office visits is we make sure that the ileocecal valve is working. We make sure that patients have enough hydrochloric acid. Um, so that would be something that we can check for in, in the office. Uh, doctors who practice applied kinesiology, chiropractors, naturopaths, and some others who are trained in that will be able to do that for you as well. Um, but basically there's a muscle that exists right here where your small intestine and large intestine meet and that muscle can get in can get weak and stop working that allows what's in the colon to grow up into the small intestine so you can actually do a simple treatment in a, during an office visit and that restores function of that and, and can really help reduce the likelihood and the symptoms of SIBO without uh, you know very quickly so basically the research says the two processes that most commonly cause SIBO is low stomach acid, we've talked about that, and small intestine motility problems. That's what I'm talking about now. The inability for the intestines to push stuff down allows the bacteria that gets into the small intestine to stay there. So uh, this is something that an applied kinesiologist will be able to help you with, a chiropractor, naturopath, or other uh, properly trained individual. So again, uh, a brand new study from 2014, just a couple months ago, it says that um, you know, SIBO is a growing problem. That's what they're saying. We agree. And impairment of the ileocecal valve and gastric acid secretion are risk factors. Low ileocecal valve strength is significantly associated with SIBO. So again, what I'm saying is this muscle right here where your small intestine and your large intestine meet, the dysfunction there, weakness there, predisposes stuff living in the colon for crawling up into the into the small intestine. I mean, think about it. If this is a door, the door gets left open, well, that's easy for bugs that live here to work their way up. They're just going to try to fill up the space. And there's a lot of nutrition up here for those bugs to grow. So there's a lot I can say uh, on an individual basis about how to fix this. I'm not going to, you know, uh, go into too much detail on that today, but certainly probiotics are essential in treating SIBO even though there's already too much bacteria in the small intestine, there's the wrong bacteria in the small intestine. And so when we work with patients, we make sure to remove the bad bugs, we put the good bugs back in, we heal the lining of the digestive tract, and we get the stomach and pancreas and gallbladder working better. And you have to do it all at once. Uh, that's when you see really good results. So I want to thank everybody out there uh, for taking time out of your busy lives to listen to this, I think this is an important issue that is affecting people not only with methylation concerns, but really all people who are looking to optimize their health. I hope that uh, the information I've shared with you today gives you some ideas on how to improve your health and well-being. And as always, I'm here as a resource for you to help you um, navigate this uh, wilderness of natural medicine and, and getting healthy. That's what we do for people. So please leave a comment or reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Um, you can. Um, Email my office at the email below or check out my website at beyondmthfr.com. Thank you and have a nice day. Bye-bye.